Okay, so uh, this is our last lecture of the course, and we're going to talk about some of the black, uh, blockchain applications. So um, we're going to talk about kind of four aspects. We're going to start with some of the technology. How do you develop these applications? What are some of the tools that you can use and how do you access these applications? And then we're going to talk about some of the platforms. What are the people building these kind of blockchains um, for people to build on top of? Which, you know, Bitcoin is one, Ethereum is one. What are the other ones? Uh, we're going to talk about some of the real projects. That's going to be interesting to see what are what some of the people ID, people's idea about how to use blockchain. And then finally, some conclusion. Okay, so first, um, why blockchain? Why do you want to build on top of blockchain? We kind of um, talk about this throughout the course. First is the, the, the you, you use blockchain because you, you want to reduce the cost of trust. There's maybe, you know, no, you don't really trust the other person and they don't really trust you. Then using a blockchain is kind of this neutral ground where uh, you don't have to really trust the other side. You can just trust the technology. And second, it's a not only secure, but you can verify it um, and because it's on the blockchain. And then you can verify the, the transfer of value between parties. The value could be, you know, asset, uh, crypto, anything like that. And this allows the elimination of middleman. So middleman usually take a cut of the, the value being transferred. But using blockchain, it's more like a peer-to-peer -peer direct transfer. Um, between you and the other side and also it allows transparency since it's open and everyone could kind of check the you know the state of the blockchain and then also tolerate more of the the attack and shutdown to uh, compare it to a centralized system so first some of the technology so wallet um you mentioned wallet in uh, the lecture of bitcoin just basically a way for you to access your Bitcoin in that case. And in this case, it's more general sense um, that you allow you to access the things stored on the blockchain. So some of the big ones are Coinbase Wallet, uh, which has a an iOS and Android app that you can download. And then that allows you to have multi-coin support. So you can store multiple uh, crypto in it. And then you can also store digital collectibles and things like that. Same thing for MetaMask, which is probably more people use this. It's on, on, on the web, so you can download it as a Chrome extension. I believe it's a Brave ex extension. Um, it's also, they recently just released the app, so you can download the iOS and Android app. There's also a hardware wallet, which is like a USB stick that you can store your keys, private key, public key on, on, on it, um, which is uh, many consider a more secure way to doing it. And how do you sort of develop those decentralized application? You have a lot of tools that you can use. Um, so these are some of it. There's definitely a lot more, um, but these are some of the most famous one, I would say. So first you have Truffle. This is kind of like a bundle of tools that include Truffle, um, Ganache and Drizzle. Uh, those are um, three parts of kind of the D app development. You have the framework for you to develop it. You have the, the blockchain emulator that runs on your laptop to emulate a blockchain. So you can kind of deploy your contract on it and uh, play around with it. And then Drizzle is like the front end library for you to build the user interface. And Solidity, which is a a programming language for smart contract. Um, there's some other ones, but this is the currently the most famous one. There's also Remix, which is the the IDE for coding Solidity, and you have the Web3.js library that is the kind of standard library for you to interact with with, uh, with uh, Ethereum. And then Infura is for you to uh, be able to access Ethereum and IPFS, which we'll talk about later, um, API calls. This make it easier for you to deploy and use these things. 
So yeah, check that out. Um, check them out if you wanna just click on the link. So everything in this lecture, if they have something underlined, then uh, it's, a, it's a link that you can click and look into it. Some of the second technology is something called Oracle. So an Oracle is essentially, um, uh, Oracle is uh, the thing that provides data to smart contract. So you can think, kind of think of it as the, so on the graph right here, you have the web, the regular web, and you have the smart contract on the other side, but how do they kind of connect? Use um, Oracle that fetch the data on the, from, the web, from the web for you. And then this Oracle allows to feed it onto the blockchain. So this is like kind of like the connection point between, you know, blockchain and the the web, you know, 2.0 that we know right now. Um, one of the the biggest ones is Chainlink. It's a, it's like a decentralized Oracle network that allows you to you need to pay a link token, and then the Chainlink node will be able to fetch the data for you, and you can put it and store on the blockchain or you know, do some execution based on the data you, you get. Some other ones is, um, is called Teller, which is also a decentralized Oracle network. So IPFS um, stands for Interplanetary File System, which um, is basically a peer-to-peer -peer data storage and sharing platform. So traditionally you need to access like go to ask the server and then sort of fetch um, data from the database for you. But this is more like a peer to system where the files are stored in multiple computers or different parts stored in different computers and you'll be able to fetch it um, by using this technology. And Filecoin is the cryptocurrency that IPFS uses. Um, is basically use proof of space. So we kind of mentioned it, I think. Proof of space, basically you lend out, you instead of using your computational power for um, for, for providing pro um, like proof of work, you use proof of space, like you store something on your disk, disk drive to, to prove that you have done something um, for the entire blockchain network. So people who store, um, things on your hard drive, they're able to receive a coin. And this is a web browser that many people in the blockchain space uses called Brave. It is a free and open source web browser. Um, and the core feature about it is it blocks ad ads and stops the web trackers from tracking you. And a cool thing, another cool thing is there's this, um, token called BATS, basic attention token, that you can earn by watching ads. So you can um, try it out and you actually can collect uh, and earn crypto over time as you watch the those ads. So some of the platforms, what are some of the people who are building blockchains? Um, first thing is Solo and there's, um, the mission is basically financial prosperity for all, and they're mainly focused on mobile first. So you can see right here, they want mobile first blockchain platform for fast and secure and stable digital payments. And they use this proof of stake. If you remember from the previous lecture, um, another interesting thing is um, phone number public key. So it's a mapping phone number to, to addresses. So you know, you can use your phone number as your kind of point of access for people to send money to you, which is pretty cool. Um, and they have two kind of tokens running on top of it. One is Solo, which is their cryptocurrency. And then one is um, Solo Dollars, um, CUSD, which is the stable assets that's pegged to US dollar on, uh, on Solo blockchain. So the second is Conflux. Um, you can kind of see the, the thing I copied from the website, um, is basically they wanted to, to empower decentralized commerce. And then they do that through a secure and interoperable 
flow of the assets and data across protocols. And the thing that it did was they also use proof of work, but um, the, the blockchain structure is different. So if you look on the graph right here, here's the more traditional blockchain, like Bitcoin. You have like one chain that kind of dominates it all, the longest chain. Um, and they, Confluent uses something called DAG. Um, that's more of like you reference different block, multiple, um, you re reference multiple block at a, at a time. And that's more like a tree graph instead of like a linear blockchain. Um, and this allows more block to be included and which means higher transaction per second. So you can process transaction faster, which is uh, one of the, the weak points of, um, you know, system like Bitcoin and Ethereum right now, which is the, the slow processing of uh, transaction. And interesting thing about conflicts is that the founders are actually from Tsinghua. And the next is Parity. So they're really trying to build the infrastructure for a decentralized, decentralized web. So they have currently three main products. The first is Polkadot, which is interesting. It's a, a platform for connecting independent blockchains. So you can kind of think of it, uh, this is Polkadot right here. And then you should see it's like a different blockchain and Polkadot allows them to talk to each other through Polkadot, um, which is something really cool because many people are building blockchains, but those blockchains cannot really talk to one another. And this is kind of the thing they want to build a platform for everyone to, to connect. And the next thing is Substrate, um, which is a framework for building blockchains. So you can build your own blockchains um, using this uh, framework. And then they also have their own mobile wallet um, called Parity Signer that I believe is on both iOS and Android. Okay, now the next one is Consensus, which is a, a company that is based in Brooklyn. Um, and they usually produce Ethereum based um, um, projects. And it was actually founded by one of the co-founders of uh, Ethereum. Um, these are the project that they have right now. So we talk about MetaMask, which is one of the products that they have. And Infura, we also talk about it. Uh, we'll talk about Quorum next, which is enterprise blockchain um, that recently joined Consensus um, actually from JP Morgan. But anyway, um, they have kind of three parts um, to their company solutions. They do some consulting work. Um, they have labs, some incubator for projects, uh, Ethereum project mainly. And then they have Academy, which is uh, education resources so like online classes and bootcamp um, to learn how to develop Ethereum um, decentralized applications. And actually Truffle used to be part of consensus, but uh, they uh, spin off for some reason. So uh, JP, uh, JP Morgan had this project called Quorum. Um, it's basically a enterprise blockchain for business. So interesting thing about this is Quorum is able to, to do both public and private transaction. So the way it works is basically you public, it's like normal transaction, but private, you only reveal data to the people who need to know. And uh, I could talk about Quorum uh, becomes consensus recently. So consensus actually acquired, acquired Quorum um, in summer 2020 from JP Morgan. Okay, the next thing is R3. Um, and they have, R3 is a company and they have this product called Corda which is a, initially it was for a financial sector blockchain for them to manage contracts, the synchronized contracts. Uh, but then they kind of expanded to more enterprise focus instead of just financial sectors. Um, and they basically enable businesses to transact directly 
I'm using smart contracts and this allows the business to kind of reduce the cost of record keeping on their own. Um, because in more of a traditional sense, um, each company, if they want to do a contract with the other side, they want to each keep a copy of the contract. And you can imagine like in the big corporation, there's like a tons of contract they have to manage and update and keep in sync, uh, just a nightmare to, to keep their own kind of ledger of record. And blockchain is kind of um, this platform where, you know, you and the other side could um, put the contract on the blockchain. So that's easier, um, it's uh, transparent um, by using like a private blockchain, only the party involved can see, which is uh, a good use of blockchain. So they also have this thing called Corda Network. So that kind of, you can join a network and then that allows you to, to transact directly with each other. So they have this different small network um, that you can participate in and these networks also talk to each other. So ultimately become this um, whole bigger network. Yeah, I can look into more detail on this reading right here. So next is uh, Linux Foundation. This is a, a open source community called Hyperledger that develop mostly enterprise focused software solutions. So they have a tons of different projects with uh, different companies. Consensus was involved, IBM, Intel was also involved. This is um, six, I think the most, I think it, the, the biggest project that they have with uh, all these companies. And you can kind of see more over here. Um, so the, the one we mentioned are uh, distributed ledgers and they also have different kind of um, tools like libraries, um, you know, other stuff for people to develop um, enterprise focused blockchain. And one of the most famous one is a call Hyperledger Fabric. So it was uh, developed with IBM so in 2015. And it's, it's a private blockchain. So it's different than permission list blockchains permissioned. So the network participant have, you, you need to know who they are in, for them to join the blockchain. And this allows, um, a confidential transaction to happen on the blockchain. Since it's keep private and not everyone can join it. So, yeah. So next is Ripple apps. Um, they basically wanted to instantly move money to all corners of the world. Um, and it was actually interesting. If you remember from the first lecture on the history of blockchain, um, Jed McCaleb was also the, the founder of Mt. Gox, uh, also found this is uh, Ripple apps. And there's also this thing called Ripple Net that they have. There's a payment system that they built in order to transfer money globally. So yeah, what's interesting is that some of the Ripple developers have shown that you can make payments just by sending text. So from the right right here, you have like some of the transaction detail and then you know confirm transaction and then actually make transaction based on just texting. Um, which is pretty cool. Um, and XRP is the cryptocurrency on the Ripple blockchain. I don't want to get into too much detail because we want to spend some time for the, the projects, which is what we're going to talk about. So obviously there's a lot of cryptocurrency projects out there. You know, we talk about Bitcoin, um, Ethereum, Zcash, which is like Bitcoin, but you add a ZK proof to it, uh, which many more we're gonna talk about later. Uniswap, uh, MakerDAO, Chainlink we mentioned, Attention Token for the Brave Browser, um, XRP we just mentioned, Filecoin. Um, there's many, many more out there. 
and there's this um, thing called NFT, which is non-fungible token, which basically means that you cannot mutually enter, uh, it's not mutually interchangeable, which means that um, each kind of token is unique and this allows you to create kind of a digital ownership or scarcity for the token. So you can use it in like things like um, collectibles, gaming, identity, and you know, virtual or real asset, um, which is a pretty good application. We're gonna talk about some of the, the DeFi projects. Um, the first thing one is Uniswap. Uniswap, which is a, a decentralized exchange. So if you know what a centralized exchange is, is basically you go to this um, platform and then you exchange maybe your crypto to some uh, other crypto. But a decentralized exchange is basically doing the same thing, but in a decentralized way. You don't have to go through someone to exchange with um, someone. You, you can directly exchange with someone. And it's done on um, Ethereum. So it's basically like a smart contract that allow you to, to trade or uh, swap token with somebody else. So basically you have some, let's see, you have the liquidity, liquidity providers that provide the asset and then the traders can trade against the, what's, uh, what's in the reserve with the, the pool. Um, and you have to pay a certain amount of fee and then those fee are distributed to the provider based on how many shares they have in the pool. You can see from the graph right here, um, you have the liquidity provider, you have the trader. Uh, and this is kind of the smart contract that allows the, the swapping to happen. It's like a series of smart contract. Um, and they, they also have their own token, which is a governance token. So it, you have, if you have the token, it means you have a say and um, you can vote on um, some of the changes in the protocol in the future. Again, some of the readings are right here. Um, we could talk more about it in the future, but um, we're gonna have more projects to look at. So this is just like a high level overview. And hopefully after the course, we're gonna dive deeper into each project, look at some of the white papers and code to understand how it works uh, more deeply. But the, the next one is MakerDAO, which is a, a a organization built on top of Ethereum that allow you to lend and borrow money or crypto borrow, lend and borrow cryptocurrency. Obviously without without um, a middle man who's there to facilitate. So there are two kind of tokens on top. There's DAI, which is a stable coin. It's a one, actually peg one to one to US dollar. And it's created when you use a lockup ETH. So you can use a lockup some ETH and it'll give you some, the equivalent amount of DAI at the moment. And MKR is the, again, the governance token for the whole protocol. So make changes, you need to have some MKR to vote on the, the changes. The next one is the Compound, um, which is another kind of decentralized protocol for you to then and borrow crypto. Um, so you can kind of think of it as, as a smart contract on, on, uh, on Ethereum and the borrow is allowed to, they can take out some of the loans and they pay some interest rate. And then the lenders can provide the loans and earn interest, earn money from the, the interest rate uh, paid by the borrowers. And there's uh, two tokens on it as well, comp and uh, C tokens which is a governance token and the C tokens is a representation of the asset that you lock on the, on the smart contract. The next one is Aave. I hope I pronounced that correctly, but they are also a kind of um, lending and borrowing platform. Um, so the depositor provide the liquidity, basically put the, put the money into the reserve for the pool, and you'll be able to earn interest. Borrowers were able to borrow and pay the interest. Basically the depositor would earn money based on the interest paid by the borrowers. 
and then two cool thing about um ave is the two unique features that they have is rate switching which allow you to switch uh, interest rate and the other thing is flash loans which is an instant and easy way for you to borrow um, without any collateral and it's done within one single transaction which is pretty amazing you can look more on the flash loan uh, resource right here Yeah, this is just kind of like high overview of the, the project and you can look deeper into it if you're interested in any one of them. But the next one, we're moving towards more of a social impact, blockchain for social impact. And the first thing is uh, Farmer Connect. So it's a blockchain supply chain. So the immutability of blockchain is really good for um, supply chain. And this is what Farmer Connect did. Um, so we have this platform called Farm and Connect that monitor the, the steps of the product going through each stage. And interesting one is they have this app called Think My Farmer and the users who receive the product are able to access the story behind the product. So you able to trace back where exactly did it come from? Um, was it made, you know, was it made in a responsible and sustainable way? You're able to check that. Um, and you're also allowed to have direct um, donation to farmers, which is a pretty cool, a cool thing to have. And they also work with IBM. Um, so yeah, there's also this farmer ID, which is a identity verification software that verifies the identity of farmer that allows them to use uh, both these and this and this. The next one is called Plastic Bank. Um, the mission is imp to empower the world to stop ocean plastic. So some of the challenge of, uh, so recycling plastic, basically what I mean. Um, some of the challenges that they might have is in some of the poorer countries, people won't need to, you know, collect the plastic and then trade for money. But the challenges are many of them don't have ID, which means they don't have access to bank. And usually if you pay in cash, um, you know, there's some safety concern with that, um, depending on the region. And also if you pay in cash, the bookkeeping, the, the keeping track of the all the transaction will be a nightmare. And also you want to have full visibility of the supply chain for partners. So they collect this plastic and they want to sell it to people who want to use reuse the plastic to build something. So, and those people, those partners want to know where exactly did the plastic come from. And blockchain seems like a good solution to this. So they don't, people who are, are recycling the plastic don't need, um, no, don't need to have a real ID. They only have need to have like a mobile phone or even like a, a paper wallet allow them to make transactions. And What's pay is not cash, it's uh, crypto or tokens that they can then use to buy their daily needs for food and clothes and something like that um, in a safer environment without, you know, people mind take away your cash. And basically what it does is the financial inclusion part, which is, you know, allow those who don't have bank asset access to have a place online on the blockchain to store their assets and also transparency for people to see where the plastic is coming from. Okay, go move a little faster. Um, this, this project called Building Blocks by the United Nation World Food Program. And what they did was they wanna build a blockchain for zero hunger. So it's basically a cash distributed system for people in need, um, especially refugees. So. And you can kind of think of it in an old traditional way. Um, you need to either deliver um, the food to them, which is um, expensive. And this could actually skew the local market price. If you know they're coming, you could, you know, skew up your price and then they have to buy a more expensive and stuff like that. And also in the traditional way, it'd be a slow process to transfer money 
you have to go through a lot of different institutions and each, uh, each, um, each institution will actually take some transaction fee and it's going to take a long time. And if you transfer it to a corrupt uh, local government or the bank, it actually take all the money away and nobody, no, no one who really needs the money will get the money. And what they built was this proof of authority um, consensus blockchain, which is uh, basically a private blockchain that only a select number of people could validate a transaction, uh, update the ledger. And the two technology that use in, in delivering those cash to people is, um, or money to people is blockchain, obviously, to keep track of um, the people who, to keep track of the transactions. And then this biometric identity management system to make sure that the people who receive it is the person who they say they are. And some of the results is uh, pretty amazing. Okay, we have 10 minutes left, uh, we're gonna go faster. Um, some of the results are pretty amazing. In 2019, they actually sent three million US dollar per month to over a hundred thousand uh, beneficiary across uh, um, two refugee camps in Jordan, and just an amazing way to use a blockchain. And also, Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation. They also have this project called Moja Loop, which is also about financial inclusion. Um, easier payment for um, mobile payment blockchain system. So they work in Ripple to do this. And they're actually connecting, you know, payment provider and bank to the platform and then connect the user, which, uh, you know, an easier way for those who don't have bank access just yet. And be able to help people with that. If you create like a one single ecosystem for people to use. And also the, this is another uh, um, application for supply chain. Um, so the WWF uses blockchain to track, they actually work a consensus to track the, the supply chain of tuna. It's called tuna project. You can click the link to, to look more, but um, you can see the tuna is right here. And then what comes to the tuna is a QR code. And the QR codes, if you scan it, has the history of where the tuna is coming from. And this actually able to kind of solve um, or at least, you know, fight a little bit of the illegal and unreported fishing because each, um, you know, tuna will have some sort of ID and QR code to it that you're able to see where you're coming from, which is hard to replicate. And then IBM blockchain, um, IBM is providing blockchain as kind of like a service. Um, they help develop hyperledger fabric that we talk about. And they also have this supply chain project with Walmart uh, called IBM Food Trust. So this is uh, what it kind of looks like from the demo on their website. You have like each stages and then some of the data recorders right here and going forward. You also have some decentralized identity solutions and they have many actually uh, blockchain for social good projects. So one of which is uh, for natural disaster. So there's this um, short film on called Bonds of Trust, which is uh, there. One of the project is um, use blockchain for natural disaster. So let's say a hurricane came, and then that you know after the hurricane. People have to clean up the houses. They have to file a lot of paperwork for an insurance company to to pay for their, you know, the aftermath of the hurricane. And it's like a, a ton of paperwork, like binders and binders of paperwork. And it's hard to keep track of everything. And they build this kind of thing to help keep track of everything on the blockchain for different parties to see, have the same record of data. So yeah, I encourage you to check it out. I think it's a 15 minutes short film uh, from this link right here. Now, lastly, we have uh, Facebook. They have a project called Libra. So according to Facebook from, I think the white paper for Libra, 1.7 billion adults globally still are outside of the financial system. And even though 1 billion of them out of the 1.7 billion have mobile phone. 
And so what Facebook Libra is trying to do is to target those group of people who still don't have bank access, access and um, provide a, a mobile payment system on blockchain. And yeah, it's uh, open to everyone to use the platform. So they're actually a private blockchain at the moment, but in the future, they want to make sure that it's um, become more of a permissionless uh, system. And MOVE, programming language for the smart contract. So instead of Solidity for Ethereum, uh, MOVE is uh, the language for a Libra. Yeah, so they also have this um, Libra association, which include a lot of other companies who want to build kind of the same thing around Libra. But actually at the end of 2019, seven of the Libra Association, I'm not sure about how many now, but some of the big names actually dropped um, out of the, the association. Thanks to um, companies like PayPal, MasterCard, Visa, eBay, and Stripe. Um, because, mainly because of the some of the Congress regulation on Libra. Um, So yeah, so they're, they're currently facing some backlash from the, the regulators in the United States. Okay, moving forward. Um, some of the conclusions. So if you look at all the project, you can kind of imagine some of the opportunities can be found where there's inefficiency of people, the way that people store data and then some of the place where there's middleman who's taking too much of the, the value being transferred, who's slowing down the process, who's being not trustworthy and dangerous. Um, and an opportunity can actually be created by um, changing the way that people live in a centralized system and build a decentralized uh, alternative way for people to, to live in. And lastly, I wanna end with a quote from the short film, IBM short film, uh, Bonds of Trust is that we need to talk, people need to talk less about what blockchain technology is and more about what you can do for people. And that's when the power of it um, comes out and it's actually understood. So that's why the, the this lecture is on the application um, for you to actually build projects. Um, and you know, after you understand how blockchain works and be able to now actually be able to apply it and affect people. So yeah, if you have any questions just ask or uh, here or in the group. Here are some of the homework assignment. Um, this one's pretty interesting. Uh, make sure you check it out if you want. And this one's also pretty cool. And I also included some resources for blockchain for social impact. So this is actually, there's two reports that's very nice for, which include a lot of uh, more projects on how people use blockchain for social change and social impact projects. So check these two out. Um, but yeah, these two, the one we talk about. But yeah, uh, with that, I want to thank you for listening and joining this course. This is the last lecture. Uh, tomorrow we actually have a other workshop, but after that, this uh, the course will end. I appreciate you all joining this course. So thank you.